This is some of the best YouTube advice that you need to hear. Enjoy. Phase one is you make something and you post it. That's it. You just gotta post something sometime, somewhere. And believe it or not, a lot of you guys haven't even done phase one, which is why I have to outline it. Number two is that you post something consistently. You create a cadence or a calendar around when you post. You find a platform that you like, ideally one that you're probably already using, and you just post again after you posted once. And you say, you know what? This was seven days apart. If I do this every seven days, I will now be consistent. For me, I just know that there's one day a week that I do all my marketing stuff. What I do on that day changes, but it's always marketing related. And the big rule with volume that I have is that there's no such thing as too long, only too boring. The second rule that I have is quality over quantity, but quality quantity wins over quality. In order to know what is quality, it usually takes reps to get good. And so you will probably do a lot in the beginning and it will probably suck, comma, and that's okay because it is a requisite for getting good. You start by sucking and then you get better and then eventually you suck so little, you're actually good. If my goal was just to be famous, which I don't want, then I would be all in on TikTok. But here's a different way of thinking about it. When I'm going to search for the new iPhone comes out, where do I go look for that video? I go to youtube.com and I type it in the YouTube search box. That is where I wanna live for those people who are searching for that information. If that answer ever changes, if it's like the new phone came out, let me go into TikTok and see what people are saying about the phone. Then I guess that is when I'll feel that pressure. But I think for the people who feel the pressure to be relevant or the pressure for the eyeballs or the fame or something like that, then you'll feel the pressure because TikTok is 100% accomplishing that now. The most viewed piece of content I have ever made in 15 years is a 12 second TikTok of me unfolding the LG wing. It has 35 million views. If I wanted the eyeballs, I'd be all over TikTok, but I'm trying to make valuable content for them. And so that's still YouTube. You know what? Absolutely, yes, yes, anyone, yes, you can be a YouTuber today. I actually read that uh, the number one new job, the number one job a lot of young people want today isn't astronaut, it isn't pro athlete, it isn't actor or policeman anymore. It's YouTuber, which is crazy to me because in 2009, you know, starting this, literally zero people had this as a job. Nobody was making a living making videos on the internet. But here's what I'll say. Turning YouTube into a job is kind of like sports, kind of like basketball. Take basketball, for example, right? It's never been easier to play basketball, to pick up basketball for the first time. All you need is a ball and a hoop, basically, and you can go play. You can play in a park. You can play in your backyard. You can play in a league, in a gym somewhere. But that's not doing it as a job. And it's the same, it feels the same as with any creative endeavor, but especially with making videos and putting them on YouTube. It's never been easier to grab a camera, the one you have on your smartphone, to start making shooting videos editing videos, all of that, the barrier for entry has never been lower. But like basketball, there's a very small number of people relatively that have combined luck and timing and of course hard work and dedication and skill to be able to turn it into their job and doing it for a living. But it's it feels almost like, like two different categories of the same activity. So my advice for people asking is always, if you wanna start doing YouTube, uh, imagine it like basketball in the park. Like if you could have fun doing that every day and never making a dime off of it, you're gonna have a great time. It's fun. But I wouldn't set that expectation of turning that into a job. There's a lot more that comes with actually deciding you want to be a YouTuber <laughs> instead of just uh, signing up and getting right going from the, from the get-go. So something to keep in mind. So I'm gonna be honest, I never in a million years thought that I'd be able to make a full-time living on YouTube. I didn't start a channel because I thought it would be wildly successful. I started it because it was just something that I couldn't not do. You know, like all-inclusive vacations or half-price apps at Applebee's, except YouTube doesn't give you diarrhea all the time. Sometimes, sometimes it does. My experience on YouTube in the very beginning was just like anybody else who's getting started out with zero subscribers. Nobody watched my videos and I had a really difficult time building traction. I think the hardest hurdle for me to overcome in the beginning was investing time and energy into videos when nobody was watching them. And eventually you're gonna have to do that if you wanna build a following. You need to actually put effort and energy into your videos to help them to stand out. But I resisted that for so long and instead 
uh, made videos that were easy to make or quick to make. And I was really hesitant to put the 20, 30 hours a week into my videos that I currently do. Level one is get going. And this is like your first three videos. Now, if you're starting completely from scratch and you have zero experience, then a huge hurdle that holds people up from starting a YouTube channel is actually just not getting started with the thing in the first place. So what I'd be doing is I'd just be making three videos. Maybe they're shorts, maybe they're videos I don't even edit. Maybe I'm just making them on my phone and speaking to the camera and uploading them to a new YouTube channel. I would create a channel, create maybe some channel art on camera Canva or something like that. And this is kind of like the first three dates that you go on someone if you're in the dating world. You know, you're kind of getting to know them, you're seeing if you vibe, and in those three videos, I'd get some pretty good insight into how I feel about making videos. I'm gonna be absolutely terrible at it because like with any skill, it takes ages to get good at the thing. But at least at the start, I've made some kind of effort in doing it. Like for example, if you're watching this right now and you haven't yet started a YouTube channel, I suspect the thing that's holding you back is probably overthinking. I suspect it's probably overthinking about your niche. What the hell do I make videos about? Why would anyone watch my content? Will people at my job respond poorly to the fact I have a YouTube channel? All of that overthinking just gets in the way of people. That's why level one is to get going and just make those first three videos. So essentially, yes, at the end of the day, if you boil it down, what YouTube wants is they want people to click on a video and they want to watch it. Like at its core, that's what it is. Now you can like draw little lines and go as deep as you want into how to get people to click and how to get people to watch. I mean, essentially by studying the algorithm, you'll learn that you're more studying human psychology, right? What do humans want to watch? What do they find enjoying? Not because like, you, anytime you say the word algorithm, just replace it with audience and it works perfectly. Like the algorithm didn't like that video. No, the audience didn't like that video, mm. now, you know, because literally that's it. If people are clicking and watching, then it gets promoted more. And that's all, that's literally all the algorithm does is reflect what the people want to a T. And if you deny that you just make terrible videos and are trying to find a scapegoat. Like, uh, I mean, there's a reason everyone loves YouTube and, you know, spends hours every single day on it. So, so far in this video, I've talked a lot about finding the right idea, the right title, because that's what I have yep. a lot of data on, but that just gets people to click. There's this whole other side and people have tried to copy your thumbnail strategy, copy your title strategy, but yep. you're a master of audience retention as well of keeping people on the video. I guess it's delivering on the video, but how do you hold people for so long and what are other people doing that's killing their retention? Oh gosh, <sighs> where do you begin? I mean, we'll start at the beginning. Essentially, your title and thumbnail set expectations. And at the very beginning of the video to minimize drop off, you want to assure them that those expectations are being met. If you click on a video where, you know, uh, of his, where it's like tether is a scam. And then at the very beginning, he starts talking about literally anything else. Then you are like, oh, this is bullshit. This isn't what I clicked on. But if at the very start of the video, you go, Tether is a scam, and I'm gonna teach you why, then it's like, okay, you match the expectations. So at the very beginning, match the expectations, and then you wanna exceed them. So you wanna assure people that what they clicked on is what they're getting, and then blow their mind and be like, but you're also getting even more. That's how you, you lower drop off, which a lot of people, sometimes it takes them like 20 seconds to really meet the expectations. And so you lose, like, that's where you're gonna lose everyone. Everyone's videos start like this, and then it levels off. So you wanna reduce the amount of people that click off on the audience retention graph. I hope you're popping up graphs while I'm saying this, so, so it's easier for people to visualize. Wanted to check in to make sure that you're enjoying this video, and if you are, make sure to hit that subscribe button, and let's keep going. I would say nearly every client I currently work with, or I've worked with over the last three years, I have said the word slow down to. This Minecraft channel I work with, Dom Minecraft, I, I think I showed you on the intros before. Yeah. He would, he would tell you firsthand, you think that's fast. You should have seen what he was doing before he started working with me. Like, oh, wow. I've been like, hey, Dom, you're an incredible editor. You're incredible. He is a really good YouTuber and he's really driven to, to succeed with this channel. But nearly every time he shows me the intro, I'm like, why did you cut that so fast? That just like you, you should have let me like dwell on the point you just made. Or like one of my biggest pet peeves is when someone like sets up a really big storyline that's going to happen in the video. So for example, he tries to achieve something, he can't achieve it. So then he says, I'm going to come back and attempt this later. It's just classic retention. It's just like, yeah, we're going to come back and achieve this later. It's a, yeah. cl a classic storyline. What people who do it too fast will say is like, oh, I couldn't get this. So we're going to come back and do this later. Bang, next thing, you know? Where it's yeah. like, I want to hear like, oh, this is a struggle. I, I really want to achieve this. So I'm going to come back and do this later and see if I can get it. And like, actually give me a bit of time to process what you've actually said. Sometimes people just use such fast language and such fast editing that 
you can't process the important moments. I really wanted to think of YouTube differently. And I really wanted to figure out a way to make the videos we're making not feel exploitative. Did not I, tell me you brought, brought the graph. I brought the graph. Oh I my gosh, graph. you brought the graph. So you, you have this graph. <laughs> I feel like I'm giving a TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, give us a TED talk. Okay, everyone. So, and so, <laughs> dude, so thank you for doing this. So Ryan Train's TED talk begins <laughs> now. This is like, this is basically the framework we developed. It's redemptive work versus exploitative work. And if you look at the what, how, why, you're basically seeing that the what of exploitative work, which is, in my opinion, the idea of like retention hacking, like not making a good video, just right. doing something that's good enough for people to click on it, and then hopefully making an experience that's good enough to where they watch the whole thing so you make money. Goal is numbers, views, money. Redemptive work, the difference is what we build is we create for restoration. The whole goal of the video is different. It's not for rewards, profit, it's for restoration in the consumer. And so the idea is it totally shifted from how do I strive? How do I like get control? And it's 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 such a loving like it's almost like a maternal approach to work. It was just so beautiful to me. And finally, the why. This is like the coolest to me. Mm. So the exploitative version of doing anything. We win by force. It doesn't matter what it takes. Doesn't matter who hurt, gets hurt in the process. And right. so to me, that's just like a, a level of even treating your team right, and even like treating the people around you right that help you make what you make. Mm. Because the redemptive version of that is we serve for the greater good. The idea of like being able to serve for the greater good is so much more empowering than trying to win by force. It seems like all of us rather than exactly me or this group this exactly. small circle. Yeah, and it's it's such a crazy picture. Like it's like this picture of just like holding weapons to get what you want versus arms open. I really encourage anyone who feels like they're like what they're creating or what they're doing is like exploitative and doesn't feel right to just like try to shift the exact the exact same product, like shift how you do it. And you right. can actually achieve the same thing in a much more loving way. It's really changed my life. And even just like from a career perspective and even how, like people I work with, it's just so, so fun. And I feel like I could do it forever when I think of it. Like whenever it was exploitative, I feel like, okay, maybe a few more months. When you're operating out of fear, yep. when you're operating and trying to get what you want, forcing it to, to make it happen, yeah. there's this huge part of your brain that's just dedicated to the worries and stress and yeah. anxiety and how am I gonna make this happen? How am I gonna make what I don't want happen yeah. not happen? But and now it, you're, you can go with the flow a lot more and just know that your your mission is there already being accomplished. It's like less outcome dependent too because you're not worried about um, the audience validating it. Like when you give a gift, it, it's just a gift. You're not worried about like, is this going to give me enough energy back to be able to create the next video? And so I felt like I was burning out for years and years. Now, throughout this research period, the second question that I would ask myself is what am I good at and what am I genuinely interested in? Now, if you were someone who's using YouTube because you have a business and you want to get more customers, you likely already know the direction that you want to take your channel. Whereas for someone like me, when I started my YouTube journey, I didn't have a business. I didn't care about getting customers. I wanted to do YouTube for fun. And more importantly, I wanted to be an influencer. I wanted to grow my subscriber rate. That was my initial objective of why I wanted to start YouTube. Because I knew I wanted to be a YouTuber, I wasn't 100% clear on what videos I should be creating. And looking back, I think it's really important to find topics that you're genuinely interested in because YouTube is hard. There are going to be times where your patience is tested. There's going to be times where you might feel like you want to give up. But if you are someone who's doing YouTube and you're sharing topics that you're genuinely interested in, that's going to give you a competitive edge over someone who wants to do YouTube just for the sake of doing YouTube and is trying to copy and paste what other people are doing. Now, of course, I don't want you to overthink this too much because over time, you are going to evolve as a creator. For example, when I started my channel, I was genuinely interested in helping people quit the nine to five. And this is a topic that I could talk endlessly about four years ago. But as I grew in age and experience in maturity, my interests also shifted and you can see my channel shifting along with my interests as well. But all in all, I personally think that if you want to create longevity for yourself on this platform, it's gonna be really important that you find a reason outside of getting subscribers and outside of making money if you want to stand the test of time.
Now, if you are someone who is uncertain on how you can answer this question of what am I good at or what am I genuinely interested in, I highly recommend that you ask your friends and family for an objective opinion. One thing that I like to do is I like to ask people what they believe my strengths are or what they believe is something that comes extremely easy to me that doesn't come easy to them. That's how I found my niche about social media. I didn't realize how good I was about social media until people told me. And a lot of times when you're genuinely good at something or you're genuinely passionate about something, it seems really easy. And when something comes easy, it's easy for us to discount that and think that it's not worth starting a channel about. Because we think that, oh, if it's easy, anyone can do it. But the truth is, is that your secret sauce is in the things that come easy to you. Because there are plenty of things that you're really good at that other people aren't good at. And that is going to be the secret sauce of your channel. This summer, like during in June, like June 1st, I was just like, I hated my school. I hated my social life. And I was like, this sucks. I've always wanted to start a YouTube because like what kid doesn't, I don't know. I really wanted to start a YouTube. So I was like, all right, let's do this. So I made it like lookbook. Oh God, Lord help me. A I, I made it. Okay. Yeah. I seen it. I'm okay. so glad. Don't ever look. Pretty. I watched I'm it. I'm not Is kidding. Is your first video no. on your channel? I watched it. It's so let's pull it up right now. Actually, let's watch it together. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> It's so cringe, but I'm leaving it for content, like to show my growth. I'm leaving it to show my growth. I tried to be like some sort of like, like I was trying to be a lifestyle YouTuber, you know? That's what everyone does in the beginning is that they copy what everyone else is doing. What's doing well right now? Like with girls anyways, beauty stuff. Ugh, I'm not that type, right. but I was like, do you know what? I'm just going to do it anyway. So like for the first maybe 20 videos, no, 10. I was like doing these weird, like, duh, like girly videos. And I am so not like that. And it was so hard for me. And it was like mentally hard. Cause I'm like, this is so not sustainable for me. I will definitely run out of ideas in like five minutes. No one watched my, I mean, it took me so long in the beginning. Like it was like, I wasn't gaining any subscribers, but I was posting every single day. I was worried every you every day, every and you were still in high day. school at this point. It was summer. Oh, okay. Okay. And I just did not care. I'm like, what? I want to do well at this and I'm going to, I don't, I, no one was watching my videos. I was literally getting five views per video. Were and you I was like, promoting it? No, I, no one on my social media knew about it. No one, I didn't, no one knew I had it. I didn't tell anyone until I literally had like 5k and I was like very secretive about it. I didn't hang out with anyone over the summer. I literally made these stupid videos in the beginning. Then who filmed them? Me. But my dad also helped my dad because my dad's like, you know, he has like a nice camera. He's like an artist. He like knows about like composition and shit. He takes some of my photos, too. And um, and so like he really and he was like, you need to do something creative because you're literally you're literally I was so in I was in such a bad mental place. And I because I had nothing. I was like, my life is so boring. Like, I'm so bored. And so I was like, I need, and I was just dwelling on like everything else. I needed a distraction. YouTube did that for me as corny as it is. And so I kind of like started to figure out like that, like the videos I would do where it was like my personality and like me just like doing whatever and like being random. Like when that kind of started like snowballing, not like subscriber wise, but like with me, like I was coming up with a bunch of ideas and it just snowballed because when you're doing something that's like your own, like it was my, at that point it was uncharted territory kind of. And so then I like made a vlog about like getting a fidget spinner and it was like my first vlog ever. And it was so fun for me. And I was like, I'm never going back to that old beauty shit. So then I kind of like made normal, like, or the video is kind of like what I'm making now. And then I made that. Um, and that was like, it took about, I think it took about a month to get my first 100 subs. Okay. And this was like a year ago or what? Oh no, this was like this five was months like ago. In June. What? Yeah, it was really, it was, this has been, this is so insane. It just went from like, so it was like this summer, this thing started. By the time school started, I had about 100K. I made this car vlog. Basically, it was my first car vlog. And this video got like 100,000 views. How? Like how? It just took off. Like it just, something about it, maybe the way I tagged it, maybe the fact that it was like my first time driving alone. That was the video. It was my first time driving alone and it was like, I just got my license. And so- you just got your oh yeah i guess you're 16, I'm 16 yeah. Yeah. yeah so i just five got, months ago you just got your license yeah that's crazy and i'm still dri i'm driving everywhere i'm like that's my thing that was really fun for me and i like that and so i kind of incorporated that into my videos now i love doing that it's my favorite thing i love driving vlogs it took me seven years to hit one million subscribers it took one year to hit two million eight months to hit three million six months to hit four million and then three months to hit five million so that there's there's definitely been a sort of you know a curve hockey stick. Yeah. But, but I think people, they kind of misplace where that comes from. I think people have this idea that if you're big on YouTube, you'll just keep getting bigger on YouTube. 
But I think what actually happens is that you're big on YouTube because you're starting to understand what works and therefore you get bigger because you're implementing what works. So have you heard this saying that like, create what you want to create and your passion will show through and people will find you? No. Okay, because I've heard it a lot and I actually strongly disagree with it because I think it it makes the creators think that like, they're the prize, they're the customer, when actually it's the viewers. And it's a privilege to be able to create for them, but you can't be complacent about that. They're not going to come to you just because I'm making stuff I like making. There's too many people who are doing that for that to be the case. So you have to really respect people's time and really re deliver value to them.